Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the art and science of complex sales. Today's guest is David Rock. David is author of the Sales Manager Survival Guide, CEO at Partners in Excellence, and uh, he calls himself a ruthless pragmatist. A former PhD student in theoretical physics, David early on turned his expertise and passions to sales and to problem solving and has made an um, amazing career out of it. We're so blessed to be able to learn from him. Here we go with David Brock. Well, everybody, welcome back to the art and science of complex sales. I am here with uh, a master and a legend, Dave Brock. Welcome to the show, man. See, I always know that you're a salesperson when, when somebody <laughs> does something like that, or you're not as smart as you look. So, <laughs> thanks, Paul. I really look forward to this discussion. Uh, I think everybody else on the pod will tell you that it's number two, not as smart as I look. But I don't know how smart I look, so therefore uh, we're we're in for a we're in for a treat today. Well, Dave. Uh, We've known each other for a while now, and I am super excited for everybody to get a little bit into your into your background on sales. Um, you, you do bring a lot of knowledge and wisdom to the space and a lot of experience. So let's start off with the basic question. Dave Brock, years in the industry, how do you define sales? I have a bit of a non-traditional view of sales because I have this, this kind of idea that everybody sells. And sales is really the art of engaging people who we have some shared interests, some common interests in talking about and committing to and executing change. And so how do we find those people that have shared interests? How do we incite them to start thinking differently? How do we start moving forward together with them? to execute that change in which we both achieve our goals. And so, you know, you can look at it as I might be a product manager in an organization and I want to get design engineers, development people, I want to get management, sales and marketing support for a new product development. I have to sell my ideas. I have to commit to to really driving change um, in the organization. So again, I go to the concept of everybody sells. What it is, is it's about exploring and committing to change. And what it is, is it's about shared interests, not necessarily equal interests, but shared interests where we each achieve our goals. Did you ever read the book, uh, Daniel Pink's book, To Sell as Human? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he he's got a really uh, that that impacted me in a big way. Where, where exactly what you're saying that it it is you know everybody sells right, and and everybody yeah. sells in a in a in a way, shape, or form. It's just how we do it. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, I mean, you look internally because I've managed large organizations where I've had design, development people, manufacturing operations, and all those people reporting to me. You know, and everybody's trying to get their ideas accomplished and executed and and things like that. They have to work together to do that. And so you look at the ways they do that is it's really all about selling. It's interesting. We professional salespeople impose all these kind of sometimes almost unnatural artifacts on something that's a common process within society, within organizations, and so on and so forth. And maybe if we start going to more of the common way of doing things and the common way of engaging people, we might actually be more successful. Can you share, can you dive into your story a little bit, how you got started and your your path towards this definition of sales? 
Yeah, I was never, I got into sales purely accidentally. I was um, getting my PhD in theoretical physics at uh, UC Berkeley. Really? And I, I planned to be a researcher and a, 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 a professor. And that's what my goal was. I was a real kind of mathy science nerd, and I'm still kind of a mathy science nerd and all that, and really challenged by that. And one weekend, I'm a skier. One weekend, I was up at Heavenly Valley skiing, and I was by myself, and I happened to, to meet this inventor. And so we started riding the chairlift together, and he was uh, telling me about, uh, he's a Silicon Valley guy, he was telling me about this invention he was making, and so on and so forth. And we, I started talking, and we'd ski down together and jump on, on the chairlift and, and uh go up again. And I started giving him some ideas. He was having some real product problems and in, in, in all with his invention. So I started giving him some ideas and we had great discussions. And, you know, I went back to Berkeley. He went back to Silicon Valley. And this is in the days, you know, I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, here's some things that you might look at and all. And about a week after that, I get a call and, and here I'm about 21 years old. He says, Dave, this letter was fantastic. How would you like to be vice president of R&D and product development for my company? And he, I'm a wow. 21 kid. It's a, a classic Silicon Valley story. I said, here, this startup with this new technology, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, and I was impressed. I'm going to be a vice president. And I didn't realize that on alternating Thursdays, I had to clean up the kitchen and empty the waste baskets. But... Uh, it was that kind of small startup. So I went and did that, abandoned being, going after my PhD. And within a year, we failed miserably. Mm -hmm. We failed miserably. And what I, I soon realized was it takes a lot more than a hot product to build a successful business. And so I went, got my MBA. And then for a theoretical physicist from the University of California at Berkeley, I went to the darkest side of the world you possibly could go to. I went and sold mainframe computers for IBM in New York City to commercial center banks. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and, you know, all my old colleagues at Berkeley were just, you know, praying for me or drinking or, or smoking a lot of something because Dave's gone off on the, to the dark side. Uh, and so I went up, uh, that's how I got my entry into selling it. I went up the food chain and, and started doing a lot of things like that and never so looked back. You went through the famed IBM sales training then. Yep. Yeah. But I, I think one of the things that my background really brings me that I think advantages me is, is that critical thinking, that problem solving, that curiosity, that you know, being in science, like theoretical physics, always questioning things, always looking for things, always looking at things from different points of view, that brought a, a, a thought process that causes, in, as I became a salesperson, it caused me to be very different as a seller and really engaged my customers very differently. And then as I went up the food chain into various different leadership roles, you know, I, I looked at organizations, looked at how we did things very, very differently. And so I think it's been really key. Having that training and having that background has been really key to my success and, and the huge amount of fun I have in what we do. Well, there's a key three-letter word or a three-letter question that scientists ask have to ask all the time that I think is, and I've, I've met a couple others that have gone into sales as well, and they've told me that, you know, why? Why has been their their magic is just continually needing to dive in and and uh, and ask that. Are you find do you, is that something you found in your exploration? It's, it's I, I I kind of portray it a, a different way. Is is it's kind of the curiosity. So it's asking why, why is this happening? You know, how do we change it? What can we do differently? And so on and so forth. So, so it, it's that curiosity. And then it's related to that scientists are problem solvers. So how do we address that? 
So it's that combination of things that that enables you to do this. So you look at, for instance, when I was a salesperson, I you know I had one large account. I was part of a team. There were four of us on the team. Since I was the junior guy, they gave me the worst parts of the account. You know, the the other guys had the key data centers and all that kind of thing. So. I'd start, it was Chase Manhattan Bank at the time. So I'd start Monday morning, one week at the basement of One New York Plaza, which was their corporate headquarters. And I'd work my way up to the top of the, the, the building, prospecting, knocking on doors, trying to find what things are doing and asking people about things. Then I'd go to uh, One Chase, One Chase Plaza was actually their corporate headquarters. New York was their operations center. One Chase Plaza, I'd do the same thing the next week. And there are things like I'd go to their credit card center and I'd stand watching credit card operators That was in the days where you had to, you know, uh, merchants would phone in and ask for credit card approval. I'd stand with the stopwatch and look at what they were doing and say, how could we do this better? So that curiosity and that problem solving helped me help customers think differently. It also internal, as I moved into leadership roles, you start saying, why is an organization not working as effectively as it should? And those sorts of things. So this drive to try and figure things out using that that curiosity, that problem solving, that critical thinking, and that drive to solve problems, you always figure things out. So even if I didn't know something, I could always figure out a way to solve it. One of the things that I I noticed that you talk about is is then having that having that curiosity and then being able to to put together a solution that you're confident in that you understand can actually help somebody, right? There, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that, that that have that curiosity on the front end and can ask why, but then can't formulate, can't formulate that into a solution or apply it to their product or anything like that, that ties all the way back to how I actually, how I actually help you. How in your career have you done that and then helped other people do that? I think Really making the most of that curiosity and then putting it into action. I I think it was that connection. And if you look at at science, scientists and all is, is they want to solve problems and the curiosity helps them understand the problem, helps them explore solutions, but they're driven to solve problems. Um, And that mindset brought me into selling. So whether it was the customer's problem or again, as I moved into leadership roles, is the organization isn't performing as it, it should, what's causing that? What might we do to fix it and how do we fix it? And so, you know, part of what got me to where I am right now is I became known within IBM as a problem solver. And so what people would do is when I would moved into leadership roles is I'd be given troubled organizations and I'd, you know, fix those organizations. Now there's a downside to that is once I solve the problems, I get bored. And guess what I do? I create problems. And, you know, (laughs) CEOs and boards of directors don't exactly like that (laughs) at all. But, you know, that nature of problem solving, of curiosity and problem solving in, in, in getting solutions in place has driven me as a salesperson drove me as an executive. So I'd, I'd fix trouble organizations and I eventually got you know, recruited away from IBM as a CRO for a large technology company. Uh, and it was a turnaround situation. They brought me in to turn around a troubled organization. And I went doing that a number of times. And now as a consultant, that's basically, I get the privilege of doing that every day with, with really smart people. Of You know, we're facing these challenges we've never faced before. How do we figure out what we should be doing? And how do we start putting those things in place? So I, you know, I get to do my hobby every single day, which is, you know, looking at really interesting issues, uh, really difficult problems, and working with the smartest people in the world to kind of figure out solutions to those. Well, let's let's dive into that a bit. Cause have you seen any have you seen any patterns in terms of B2B selling and where we are currently? That apply across in the challenges that we're they're facing as an industry. What challenges are we facing, and then how are we going about 
solving those? I, I think the patterns I see, I think the best starting point for that is not B2B selling, but B2B buying. And we're seeing profound changes in B2B buying. Yet, you know, the problem with B2B selling is we're still using the same old playbook that we used years ago. I mean, it may be, you know, we may have a veneer of new technology to help us execute it bigger, better, faster. I mean, right now, the big fashion is how do I, pro- you know, there is something on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, use chat GPT to create a thousand prospecting uh, notes in 15 minutes. And then, you know, you get clever salespeople. Well, in an hour, I can create 4,000 outreaches and I can start inundating people with all this stuff. You know, so, so we're, we see people drowning in information. We see customers electing to have rep-free buying experiences. So we're seeing uh, B2B buying changing tremendously. We're using our same old playbooks and it's not working. So, you know, I'm seeing, you know, uh, yesterday I was on a, a webcast where we started talking about is outbound debt. And I think outbound as we know it is, is being killed off by B2B sellers very, very quickly. And we have to look at what are the new ways we engage customers because inbound will never be sufficient to drive the growth that we should uh, want and that we deserve. So how do we engage customers very differently? What's the new playbook for creating interest attracting attention, uh, identifying new opportunities. So things like outbound is, is dying. I think the, the, uh, the old role of the SDR is changing profoundly and should change profoundly. I think we see a lot in some of the technologies, particularly SaaS technologies. I think that are fairly simple transactional types of purchases, and those can and should be automated as quickly as possible. So the people, the SDRs and AEs that are currently having that will be able to move into new roles, and it's much more efficient for the customer to be doing it this way, and it's much more efficient for us as sellers to be doing it this way. So now you say, what is the big new opportunity for B2B sellers to make a difference. You look at these technologies, whether it's chat, GPT, or other tools that are changing the way customers learn about products, the way they learn about change, that change, you know, where do we make our biggest difference? You know, and and to some degree, I think the kind of silver lining to all these changes that we're seeing in the silver lining for sales is we get freed up from a lot of the stuff that we had to spend time doing before, either within our organizations or with customers to do the things that really have an impact. You know, now customers can learn about products better, you know, through the web than they can through salespeople. So now I don't have to spend any time focusing on telling people about our products and how many features and functions we have and how fantastic we are. They can learn about that through the web. I can spend all my time helping them understand their problem and helping them solve it. I can spend all my time helping them navigate this overwhelming buying process. You know, we all know about the Gartner spaghetti chart. I can straighten that out and simplify it for them where before when I had to spend a lot of time pitching products and all that sort of thing, I didn't have the time to do that. So I can really start as a professional B2B seller changing and spending my time, even though it may be less, spending my time on the issues that are most important to our customers. I had another uh, recent conversation with with a gentleman that was talking very, very uh, specifically about this problem, how he framed it was how 
salespeople need to move the point of entry and really work very, very hard at that to, and we're not, if we're entering at a uh, stage where we're talking about features and functions and product comparisons and all of that stuff, that is no longer, I mean, people can do that different ways now. If we are entering at a, a vision state, right? We're here at the, how do we execute on our vision as a company? And truly, how do we uh, untangle that spaghetti? We, there's a huge need for that. Right? There's an absolutely massive need for that, especially with executive suites. I mean, that, that are dealing with this overload of information that we learn about from the jolt effect and others. But does that jive with you that it moves us? It actually moves our, moves the importance of the industry, importance of the industry to a much more strategic spot. I actually think there's an earlier stage that it starts allowing us to get involved in. So if you look at things like we used to respond when people, and today we largely respond when people have a need for, you know, have identified, you know, we need to change this. We need to look at these solutions for this problem. And also we come in and we call ourselves problem solvers, even though all we're doing is pitching our product. Then you had Challenger come up about 10, 11 years ago, and they started something really novel, which is how do we incite people to change, bringing them insights and those kinds of things and so on. I, I think right now where we're at is how do we incite people to search? Because the buying process is going to be digitally led, sales supported. So now we have to start having people who haven't committed to changing, but who are asking questions, what's happening in the world? Uh, what's happening with my competition? Where are there new opportunities? Who are you know, going to Google or a, a, a chat assisted Bing or whatever it is, or just even reading uh, news feeds and, and that kind of thing, you know, whether it's on LinkedIn or whatever, and saying, aha, there's a new idea here. Let me dive into that. So it's, it's really, how do we incite people to search? And in that search process, we then get them to say, there may be a new way of doing these things so that you start inciting them to change. So how do you incite people to search? And particularly when, you know, they aren't going to Google and saying, you know, Tell me the latest things that are happening in CRM and what we should be looking at in implementing CRM systems and how we should define that is, you know, you need to get to them beforehand. So they may not necessarily be searching that. I, I, uh, some months ago, I relayed an experience. I was, uh, had flown down to Los Angeles. My client was south of LAX, about 20 miles. And it was a client in a very specialized area. And I, we've been doing a lot of stuff via Zoom and on the phone and all that kind of thing. And I knew some of the key issues. And as I was driving down to their office, I noticed a, a billboard on the side of the road and the billboard offered their solution to the, an alternative to how they solved their problem. And I happen to know the key executive. I knew where he lived, and I knew he drove by that billboard every day. So when we talked about it, I said, hey, have you noticed this billboard? Because there's a solution to what we're talking about. He said, no, I've never noticed it. I drive by it every day. I've never noticed it because it wasn't in the, in the forefront of his mind. He, you know, we see all this stuff, but we don't pay attention to it until we know we have to start paying attention to it. So he was totally oblivious to driving by a solution to a problem that he had and seeing that solution every day. So how do you capture people's attention? And so I think this is where you have actually sellers getting involved very early on, inciting people with ideas and say, hey, I heard something really interesting. Let me start searching and learning more about that. I'm seeing something really interesting. What if I started adopting that for my organization and start to change? 
you know, now how do I start doing solving that problem? So I think we're getting into that cycle where a large part of outbound will be shifted to giving people ideas through deep expertise and inciting them to search and then how we help accelerate and guide them through that process to committing to a change and committing to buy something. And we've seen examples of that for years and years and years. When I ran a division at IBM, we used to have a customer conference every year and, and I would invite experts in kind of almost futuristic type things. And they'd come in and drop these ideas on these executives about where the world was going, how it might have impacted their industries, and so on and so forth. And you know, I'm kind of crass the way I express this. I, at the end of the conference, I'd say, how many of you are interested in learning more about these ideas? Raise your hands. And they became our prospects because all of a sudden they had this idea. They wanted to learn more about it. And those would become my prospects for driving new business. And so we see that in all sorts of ways right now. We see on LinkedIn, the opinion shapers, the people coming with new ideas. We see on some of the podcasts that we listen to, people having ideas that cause me to say, I want to learn more. One of my favorite podcasts, I have to like it, is the uh, armchair expert, Dak Shepard uh, and Monica is I love listening to those interviews. And one of the problems I have is when I listen to the, those interviews, I'm in my car usually, I have to pull over, I go to Amazon and I start ordering all these books because <laughs> they've given me ideas and I have to start changing things. Yep. So I think that's kind of the evolution of, of uh, B, complex B2B sales. There's something that's fascinating about that to me, which is, you know, if you study the history of sales, the, the problem is different, but similar. We're ignoring information for different reasons. When we early on in sales, it was because we used a lot of these similar techniques, right? Because there was too few areas of innovation that we that we had as buyers, right? So early on, there you could go to a conference like that, or you could go to, but there wasn't a whole lot of them. That you could access, right? So you would go and you'd have a very good, you know, experience and raise your hand. And then on the other side of it, and then you have the internet age where that information just became highly, highly available. And it's transitioned to information overload. Well, it, information overload isn't that much different than than a lack of information because you're you don't have access to the information that you need to move yourself forward in a good way. One is because there's too much of it at you. The other, because there wasn't enough outlets for it. And so in some ways, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, it, some ways the the old school is becoming the new school in terms of selling. Yeah. And, but yeah. the problem is because of that attention span, that the lack of ability to pinpoint on things that can truly help you. Yeah. Well, but, and I think it's changed. Uh, I think there are uh, some other factors in here that made the change even more profound is if you look back in history is where did customers get information? Where did they get new ideas and all? And they would go to conferences and trade shows, you know, they'd go talk to peers and, and all uh, and that kind of thing. But sellers were people that came to them with a lot of new ideas. Well, now they don't need sellers to do that. So they do search and things like that and, and conferences. Um, so that's freed up our, our, our time to focus on other things. But again, you start saying, so, so we've migrated how we work in a, a slightly different way, but customers no longer need that. So now you start saying, what do we do? And I got a little off track. There's, what I was leading to is I've been doing a lot of studying recently around the concepts of scarcity and abundance. And so when you start thinking of, and you apply that to selling, is sellers were valued as purveyors of information because information was scarce. And access to that information was really important 
to customers as they started thinking about new ideas. Mm-hmm. Now you look at what happens when something becomes abundant. Let's look at, for instance, food in the U.S. Food is abundant in the U.S. And look at the amount of waste in it. Look at the amount of bad diets and things like that. And, and all because food is abundant, easy to get, relatively cheap to get, so on and so forth. So we stop caring. Same thing about information. When information is abundant, we stop paying attention to it because we can always get it when we need it. The value of information becomes much, much less to us. So now, as we look at sellers, you have to start saying, what's scarce? What's scarce to our customers? And so part of that, you can go through, there's, I I wrote a a post about it the other day. You start looking at it. Time is scarce to our customers. They can't get more time. How do we help them use their time more effectively? Sense-making is scarce to our customers. How do we help them make sense of things? Uh, If you look at, you reference Matt and Ted's great book, The Jolt Effect, that's scarce. It scares them. So how do we start addressing those things which are scarce to them? You know, caring about our customers is scarce. So I'm thinking the new selling it kind of goes back to some of the old school ways is what if we come in and start looking at the relationship? What do we come in if we start dealing with the fears, the things that are scarce to them, the uncertainties that they have, the inability to you know, deal with the overwhelm in their jobs, the overwhelm of information and so on and so forth. Dealing with those things is what's scarce. It's what they care about. And what will attract their attention? That's a wonderful way to uh, to describe that. And I think you just hit on the the title of this this podcast because we've both noticed, and one of the things that's really really coming out is this idea of uh, human centric selling and uh, leader sales as leadership. And I think it, it always has been. The greats have always done that, but it's it becomes much more much more impactful and much more important these days as, as B2B selling is changing and how you define that between abundance and scarcity, just, uh, just absolutely flicked a light switch for me. Like that is because it is, it's real relationship, real caring, real, real problem solving, real leadership, real service. Those are at a scarcity in a world of, you know, social media abundance where everything is, uh, skin deep. Right. And so well, to be able to do that effectively is is really a huge skill set. And see, if you look at our current focus right now is focusing on abundance, making and putting more piling more stuff on, it's not capturing their attention. They do, don't care. That's not what they're worried about. And you look at at the things like Matt and Ted talked about is is fear of messing up of what Brent used to talk about in terms of decision confidence, which is related to the jolt effect stuff of sense-making and all those kinds of things. So we have to change our agendas to those things that are scarce and worrisome to our customers and engage them at that spot, rather than just the techniques that we're using right now is to make, is to make the abundance problem even greater. One of the things that I've found in the past six months, which is, I love this trend is, and I sell, we sell the sales leaders, right? One of the things I've found is that they're, well, and you know this as well, there's a scarcity right now of good conversations in market, that there, there's a scarcity of that, as you call sense. Hopefully people won't feel that about this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I, I don't, but <laughs> well, no, you're, you're, uh, you, you are dropping absolute wisdom. I, I can't thank you. No, I, that scarcity and abundance just absolutely clicked the light for me. And it, it's, it's applying it now to, one of the things is highly differentiating about the way that that we're selling right now is this is a focus on just quality conversations. Like I, I don't I don't care how many emails somebody sends out. I don't care how many 
I, I care about relationships and the, that ability to truly connect with somebody uh, and to do that well. But I now I'm I'm thinking about that and why that's differentiated and because there's there's a scarcity of that in market. It's been diluted for a lot of years now in favor of a volume approach, right? We've been doing some projects with some clients that just put, put stunning results. And, and it's what we've done is we've gotten the clients to start going in and minimizing to eliminating talking about the product. What they do is they focus on the customer situation, the customer business problem, and they focus on helping the customer say, what should we be, not what solution should we be looking at, but how should we be looking at this problem? Who should be involved? How do we align ourselves around what we might want to do? You know, what's the process of, of kind of going through this problem solving process? And they go through and really work on helping the customer align around the problem that they're trying to do, get all the right people involved, be asking the right questions about the problem, not solutions. And what's magic is at one point, they say, can you help? And once you get to that, can you help? Now you start looking at solutions. Now, guess what's happened in that? You've built this trust and confidence. You've built this knowledge You've built this relationship with these people dealing with very, very difficult issues. And also, as you would expect, your win rate skyrockets. But the real counterintuitive thing is sales cycles go down by 30%. Because what we've done is you go back to the Gartner spaghetti diagram. The, the customer starts at one point. We respond. Here's our solution to do that. They wander around and keep changing. And they get lost. But if we do this process up front and help them understand and think about what they do, we actually straighten out and shorten their process. We create greater confidence. And so what we're seeing in by changing this engagement, uh, by working on what's scarce to the customer up front, we improve our ability to win and we shorten the path to getting to a decision. We are. Getting to the end of our time, but I think that that is one of the more important concepts that, I mean, it's it's an age-old concept, right? Scarcity versus abundance, but how, how, how you've applied it, is, I think, is one of the more important things uh, that I've learned in the past, you know, in the past year. I think that is is truly, it's a great application. So, thank you very much for that. That's awesome. Oh, well, I know, I know people are going to, I know people are going to absolutely love it. So, it's fun. I'll send you the link for the article I wrote the other day, and maybe you can publish that in the show notes so other people can take a look at it. Yeah, abs I absolutely will. We absolutely will. Last thing I need to ask, because we are hitting the time the time limit. Now, there's two things. Number one, well, uh, can I get you back? Can you come back? There's so many other things that we can, uh, oh, can be exploring together. Twist my arm. You know, I'm passionate about a lot of these things, and and I, I love working with the membrane team and you. So uh, uh, anytime you want. Awesome, and let's let's think too. I think we could have some really good conversations. Let's grab. We can grab a couple other of our partners and really just we'll focus down on a topic and get a, a great roundtable together. That could be a another option. But and then the second is uh, how do people get a hold of you? LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So just search for me, reach out, connect and do that. Uh, my uh, blog site where I write about a lot of this stuff is partnersinexcellenceblog.com. And it has my email and all that kind of thing. And you can publish my email in the show notes and, and that. But, you know, LinkedIn and partnersinexcellenceblog.com. All right. Well, everybody, I highly recommend checking out Dave's stuff. I highly recommend checking out his his book as well. We didn't even talk about that, but uh, you can you can find that on his LinkedIn page. And then, um, yeah, I privilege to be a partner with you, and absolutely love your stuff. So, thank you so much. And with that, we will uh, we'll sign off for the day. Thanks so much, Paul. This is fun. Thank you so much for listening to the art and science of complex sales. This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. 
due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.